come in. So welcome to everyone this morning. Um, my name's Sarah Shuttleworth. Um, I work for Plant Life um, and for the last year I've been uh, running the National Plant Monitoring Scheme um, and um, I'm still doing bits with that as well. Um, this is a webinar and if you're not familiar with that then it just means that I can you can see me hopefully and my slides um, but I can't see all of your wonderful faces or hear you unfortunately. So if you do need to um, make contact with anyone, um, uh, whether that's because you've got technical issues or you simply want to say hi from where you are from, then you simply use the chat. If you have any questions for myself, um, that uh, I would beg you to use the question and answer function, which is um, something that you get with webinar functionality. Um, so you can just type your question in there and we'll hopefully get a chance to go through them at the end. Um, it just makes it slightly easier for us to look for the questions than trawling through all of the chat. As I said, we will have a question and answer session at the end. And I'm unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get through everyone's as I imagine we'll have lots. Um, but my colleague Felicity, who is busy being my technical support in the background, um, who has also um, created this wonderful program of digital events, she will be there to help me at the end um, to deliver some questions. One of the other things I might say is if you would like to um, maybe get yourself a pen and paper um, just to make some notes. Um, and also if you wanted to, we've got a quiz later on, um, which I've set up with polls. But um, if you would rather be um, you know, pen and paper, that's absolutely fine. You can do it that way as well. Um, and at one point during the webinar, I will be stopping sharing my screen and switching cameras just to show you some props um, sort of in live with a different uh, camera angle, but then I will reshare again afterwards. Right, so I hope that we're all sitting comfortably and let's begin. So this morning, I'm going to take you through a basic introduction to plant identification. And in particular, we're going to be looking at the different parts of a plant. And this is hopefully gonna be a great tool for us to be able to know a bit more about plant identification. So we'll just go through some of the aims of what we're hoping to achieve over the next um, hour or so. I would hope that by the end we will all have learnt the basic parts of a plant and their correct names uh, and you'll be able to sort of point them out. And then hopefully you might be able to recognise these parts in some flowers on the ones that we've got photos of on the screen or maybe even going for a walk afterwards at lunchtime um, you might be able to pick up some flowers that are actually in flower at this time of year and be able to sort of identify some of those features. I would hope that afterwards I can provide you with a strong foundation for learning more about plant identification. Um, as we're just covering the basics today, um, with, you know, this hopefully will give you the good sort of basis for maybe learning a little bit more and being able to go further and maybe even attempt to use a flower key at some point in the future. Now, one of the questions is, why do we need to learn this and these things? Well, essentially, when you're sometimes looking through the descriptions of some flowers, whether that be just from Googling them, or maybe you've got one of the fancy plant ID apps, or whether you've got um, a lovely wildflower guide, um, sometimes the descriptions of these plants can be a little bit intimidating. They use some words and abbreviations that are unfamiliar um, and the whole thing can just make it seem very confusing. And sometimes that means we simply close the book or we turn it off and we go, do you know what? I don't really know what this is talking about. Um, and so it can put us off from learning anymore. We then can form that foundation of knowledge so we can go further with our learning. So once we learn all the basics here, then we'll be able to look further into the book and maybe start to investigate more species that we'd want to know about. Um, and it's just a really useful way of starting the basis of our learning. The other really useful thing is that once you learn about how to identify different parts of a plant, um, you can then use these skills um, for other areas, whether that be just moving across to learning a bit more about grasses and sedges and rushes, because uh, there's very similar terminology used there, or whether it's for a whole different group of animals, um, the sort of basis or formation of how you learn these things is very similar, um, especially when you're talking about using keys and things like that. So um, we can use that information just for learning about all things wildlife and nature, which is great. <laughs> 
So what kind of terminology are we going to hopefully uh, cover in this session? So I've got a little word cloud here and there might be some words here that you're very familiar with and you know exactly what they are, like the word petal, for example. However, there might be other words here that are completely new to you and you've never seen them before and you think, well, I don't know what that's referring to. Equally, there might be other words here that actually oh, I've seen that written down, but do you know what? I just cannot for the life of me remember exactly which bit of the plant that's talking about because I get it confused with that part and that part. And hopefully by the end of this session, we're going to be able to um, really understand what those words are and lock that in. So we're going to go over the basic anatomy of a flower, first of all, um, being that is the main part of the flower, the plant that we all look at. And it's a bit in the books that they talk about the most. And it is the easiest way to identify different species is by the flowers. Um, what I was going to do is talk about um, them in the order that we um, sort of going up and then into the center of the flower. So we're going to start with the base work our way from the outside features into the center of the flower. I'm doing this because that is generally how one learns these things. But the other option would have been to talk about maybe the features that you're already very familiar with and then work our way to the unfamiliar features. But this would have involved with jumping around to different parts and might have led to more confusion. So that is the reason for why we're starting at the bottom and working our way from the outside to the inside. This is a really basic illustration, um, the sort that you'd get in the beginning of guidebooks that just simply um, has it in very simple form. Uh, we're going to cover hopefully some different flowers as well and just how they can look very different. As we all know, nature is a wonderful thing and it comes in a huge mass of variety. So they don't all follow this nice simple pattern, unfortunately. So the first feature that we're going to look at is the very base here, um, known as the receptacle. And a sim simply the definition for this is that it's the expanded part at the end of the flower stalk on which the flower organs are all inserted into. So you can see on this diagram that it's slightly swollen. Um, it sort of forms a cup shape that everything else can sit on, um, probably where the, the word receptacle came from. Um, and they can be very, very basic um, and literally just form this base of everything else to fix onto the top, or they can be a little bit more complicated and have some of the inner workings of the flower inside, as we're going to see next. But this is the first bit that we're going to learn. So it is the base of everything. Um, if you were to be drawing um, a sort of classic diagram of, a, of a, a child's illustration of a flower, you'd simply have the stalk going straight up with the flower at the top. Um, what we never draw is the fact that it does bulge slightly as it gets to the top to be the base for the flower itself. So that's the receptacle and we'll look at some examples. So you can see the first illustration here is essentially very much similar to what we were just looking at. It's um, that sort of basic cup like um, bit at the top of the stalk that sort of ends up to about here and it forms that sort of basis for all the other floral parts to sit on. However, when we look at this diagram here, you can see that when it's been sort of sliced across, it's got a lot more going on in the center here. Um, and these are some of the inner workings of the actual sort of reproductive organs of the flower itself. Um, in this case, these are sort of the parts of the ovary with the, the little immature seeds forming inside. But essentially, it's this housing that we're talking about called the receptacle um, and where everything is fixed into. So if we were to slice across um, this one, you can see you've got the main stem coming up here and it slightly swells just before it forms this um, hollow area that every other flower is attached to. Um, but this is essentially the receptacle there. On this species, you can see again from a different angle, the stem coming up along here and then it just swells to form this base underneath where the flower can sit. And if we're then to slice this one open, you can see it's very much like the illustration over here. You can see it's got the inner reproductive organs of the flower in there. Um, but essentially, it's this housing that we're talking about that's called the receptacle. So if I just highlight that there, it's this area that is the receptacle. 
Now, one of the things that can definitely complicate this, um, as you saw with that first one that I just showed you a minute ago that I cut in half, when it has got the inner workings inside of it, it's um, a slightly different situation to one where it's all sitting on top, like in our first illustration. Now, I was debating whether to go over the ovary position with everyone because it is potentially fairly complex. However, one of the things that I have when I'm teaching um, plant identification with people, and we want to particularly go through a botanical key with people, is that one of the first questions it can ask you in the book is what position the ovary is in. And it can take you on one very different path to another, depending on how you answer that question. So I felt like because we're covering the receptacle here, it might be worth just dipping into this element a little bit. So essentially, this first illustration is very much like my beginning one, where you've got the stem coming up. Obviously, it would bulge slightly to form the receptacle underneath. And then we've got this egg shape bit here, which is the ovary sitting above everything else. Um, and that would be called a superior ovary, uh, where the flower parts are inserted below the ovary. So I like to think of this as the superior ovary, feeling like it's, um, it's overlording everything else. It's feeling very superior to all of the other flower parts because it's sitting right on top of them. And that can be a helpful way of remembering it. Whereas over here, we've got the ovary sitting underneath those flower parts and the flower parts are actually inserted at the top of the ovary here. Um, and this means this one is inferior. It's very much below everything else. So it's feeling a bit inferior. That's the way I like to remember it. The, the photographs I've got here show a sort of that thing happening. You can see you've got the flower parts attached up here and then underneath we've got the ovary sliced through that's being housed in the receptacle there. And similarly here, there is an in-between the superior and the inferior. And these ones are sort of showing that where it's not quite at the very top of the ovary, but it's slightly further down. But for the sake of learning at this point, we're just going to learn that it can either be on top or somewhere beneath or at least halfway house. So that's where we can get a bit technical with the receptacle. So the next parts that we're going to look at, um, you may have been familiar with this term before, the sepals. Um, now, these are basically usually the sort of green bits that are underneath the base of the petals. Um, when we look up the technical description, it says it's a sepal in itself is a single part of the outermost row. And they use the word whirl when describing this rather than the, the word row. And whirl simply means the way that something is arranged around a center point. Um, so if you were to have a, a pole in the middle and you have everything coming out from the same point in a circle around it, that would be a whirl. Um, so when we're talking about these different rows, they would refer to it as a whirl of floral organs. So believe it or not, the sepals are part of, they are a floral organ, even though they don't have the sort of pollen or anything with the um, seeds in, they're part of that flower that is there for reproduction. The sepals are usually green, but actually in quite a lot of species, they're not. And the whole purpose of them is to come together and protect the flower when it's in bud. So before it's opened out to this beautiful flower, they will all be there connected together, um, protecting that flower as it's growing. And that's their purpose. And obviously, once it's already opened out, they're then just underneath um, becoming less important in some respects. Now, where it can get a little bit complicated, is that you can refer to the entirety or the group of sepals as the calyx. And you may have heard this word before, or you may never have heard this word. And essentially, you could refer to ones like this as just the sepal and the sepals. However, sometimes the sepals are fused together, or at least partly fused, to create a structure underneath the plant. And in those cases, in the books, they will be described as the calyx. But again, it is simply, again, the outermost row or whirl of floral organs, which can be divided into sepals or not. So I will look at some examples on the next slide. So you can hear, see here we've got an example of three sepals. So you've got the receptacle coming up here and the sepals are coming out just like we talked about at the beginning, nice and free from each other. And you can see on this example of this lovely geranium, You've got these sepals all behind the petals in that star shape. 
and over here on the bud they're nicely closed together um, protecting that flower before it opens. However, you can have it where they're, they look free, but actually at the base, they're all joined together to form a sort of unit together. So they would be called partly fused sepals. You can then get them where they are pretty much fused all the way to the tip, except for dividing out into sort of teeth or different shapes. And those are fused sepals. And then definitely in this case, they would be referred to as the calyx or even the calyx tube, particularly with this one that has formed a tube shape. So if we look at some real life examples here. We've got the beautiful ragged robin here, and you can see that there's very much a sort of tube type thing with these ridges, and then it divides up finally up to these teeth at the end. But that's definitely a calyx, which has come together to form that structure that supports the flower when it's out. But also you can see here where the teeth are closed at the end, it's supporting that when it's in bud. Here we've got a campanula species, uh, one of the bell flowers, and you can see that here they're partly fused um, up to a certain point and then spread out. And obviously they're all covered in these long white hairs. So sometimes knowing when it's talking about the calyx and which part that is, because it's got some distinguishing features um, then that's kind of be really important to know that maybe the calyx is very spiny, hairy or bristly, hairy, or that sort of thing. There's a whole group of plants, um, sort of part of the nettle family that have a very, um, very much have a calyx here uh, where the sepals are all fused together to form this tube um, that then splits into an upper and a lower lip. Um, and the upper lip has these three teeth and the lower lip have these two pointy teeth. And again, the calyx will be referred to in the description of this plant and knowing the number of teeth or lips are really important in identifying features for these species. Here we've got Samphoin, one of the pea family. And again, you can see that there's a calyx that's been formed and then these very long protruding teeth here. Um, and it's just this bit that we're talking about. So. Individually, when they're separate, they are sepals. When they're fused together, that's when they are referred to as the calyx. Hopefully my next slide is coming up. Right. So now we're getting into a little bit more familiar territory, one would think. We're going to be talking about petals. Um, I would like to think most people might already have some understanding of what a petal is. Um, but the, the description is it's usually a free unit of the second floral row, so the one in from the sepals. But again, there is another bit, term here used for the collective group of petals, and you could call that the corolla. And that's, uh, again, still the second row of floral organs. Um, most of the time when they're free petals, you would still refer them as petals, and it might say in the description that there are a certain number of petals. However, they very much like the sepals can be fused or partly fused to create an altogether different looking structure, in which case you would be calling it the corolla because it can conform a corolla tube like in many species. So if we look at some examples on the next slide. So if we have a look at some examples of the free petals, first of all, We've got the beautiful um, cranes bill um, here, the geranium family, and you can see the petals are all very much separate from each other, although they are overlapping quite considerably. The colour of the petals is obviously going to be one of the major things in identification, and some books are completely divided onto the colour of the flower as to where you go through. Our guide for the National Plant Monitoring Scheme, for example, is arranged in this way with flower colour. You can see that the way that the petals are angled with the veins, everything is guiding um, you to the look at the center of that flower where all of the reproductive organs are. And that's basically what it's doing to those pollinating insects. It's saying, here's the center, this is where we want you to come and land. And interestingly, sometimes the colors of the petals to us look beautiful, but to an insect, they could look even more beautiful or different because they can use different wavelengths of reflecting different wavelengths of light. But this is an example of some free petals. This example of um, one of our buttercup families, you might recognize that it's a buttercup, may not. Um, 
looks a bit like somebody has pulled a petal off, um, or at least this one hasn't grown properly over here. However, this is the Goldilocks buttercup, um, a particularly favourite name of mine, um, one of my favourite woodland flowers, actually. Um, and one of the really interesting and distinguishing features about Goldilocks buttercup is that actually all its petals don't form in the normal way. Um, sometimes you can have more than one slightly gimpy, runty looking petal, and it does look like somebody's come along and just been pulling them off at free will. And it's actually how they grow. Um, and it's quite unique and kind of makes them quite uh, characteristic and odd looking, but quite fun to see as well. I like showing my children these ones um, and saying, look, you'd think that those petals have grown in a weird way, but no, that's how they're meant to be. On this strawberry plant, you can see that the petals have this notch to create a rather, a rather attractive heart-shaped petal here. Um, but also it's really important to note that they're quite separate from each other. There's some quite large gaps uh, and that can be significant when looking at identification. Um, and particularly because in this case, you can see the sepals underneath very sort of obviously between the petals. So all of these features are things to note, but the notch and the shape of the petal is really important too. Equally with this stitchwort, you might think, oh, I'm gonna count how many petals we have on this one. And you might think, oh, there's 10 petals, but then be looking through your book and thinking, well, I can't find anything that looks like that with 10 petals. But actually it's because there's five petals, but each petal is so severely notched to the point of nearly cut in two, or we would call it bifurcated, uh, almost down to the bottom, that it looks like there's more than there are. So this whole unit here is actually one single petal. It's just that it's been cut nearly down to the bottom. And this can happen in lots of the stitch work families, but in other species as well. And then when we talk about that collective term um, for when they're fused together to form the corolla, um, this beautiful harebell rather wonderfully illustrates that um, when they're fused together like this, they formed a bell. Um, and again, this would be referred to as the corolla here. Um, so that's a good example of where one's fused together. So now we're going to move into the very center of the flower. And I've gone to talk about the female organs of the flower first, rather than um, talking about the male parts first. Um, a little bit because the female parts can be a little bit more confusing than the male parts. They're a little bit more complicated. Um, so we can spend a little bit of time on it. But essentially, this whole central unit here, which consists of the ovary, a style, and a stigma together, which we'll go into the separate parts in a moment. But this whole unit is called the pistil. So it's the um, entire unit comprised of carpal or carpals. Now, this is where we bring in another word that can then really complicate things a little bit, this word carpal, um, because it seems to almost say the same thing when I look at the definition, that it's the basic unit of the female sexual organ. And I have to say, I've seen pistol and carpal being used interchangeably or perhaps inappropriately sometimes um, when referring to one or the other. But essentially, this diagram, we are looking at one single pistil and we are also looking at one carpal. And essentially, the carpal is almost like the ovary part with a little bit extra rather than it's going up into there. But it's difficult to define that. However, I'm hoping we'll be able to explain it. Um, with the next slide. So pistil or carpal, um, this confusing terminology and how are we going to get past it? So this first diagram is essentially what we were just looking at. You've got your basic ovary and your style and your stigma and this whole one unit is one pistil but it's also one carpal. So in this instance you think right well surely pistil and carpal mean the same thing then because you're using them to describe the same thing that we're looking at. However, we move, and this is almost reinforced when we look at the next one, which when we look at this, it's three of these all next to each other that are free from each other, but they would obviously be joined at the center of the plant because they'd be fixed to the plant. And here we are looking at three pistils, and we are also looking at three carpels, but they're unfused. So you can see we've just ta simply taken one of these and multiplied it three times. Where it gets then a little complicated is over here where you think, well, that's simply just the one pistil, one carpal again. 
but actually we've got one pistol because that is the entire unit we're looking at. But if we were to cut it up nice and neatly with our dissection knife or something like that, you would very easily see that the inside is divided into, in this case for the example, three sections. And each one of these sections is a separate carpal, which means that we have one pistol, but actually three carpals that are fused into one. Um, and there are many species that have fused carpals. Um, and sometimes you can see it because there's a slight line where there's multiple carpals. Um, other times you would have to dissect it to see it. Um, a lot of the carrot family, for example, have two carpals in them um, and that sort of thing. An example of where we've got the separate unfused multiple carpals would be the buttercup family um, at the very beginnings of your book. Um, they have three carpals and lots more than three as well. They have lots and lots of them. Um, but essentially that's where we need to talk. So if you've got this unit here is your pistol, um, this unit here is your pistol, but this one's made of three carpals and that's a simple one and it's only made of one carpal. Hopefully we've got that, but we're gonna cover it again later just to reinforce that learning. So for example, looking at, um, and I do apologize, um, my illustrations do somewhat look like little tiny fairy bottoms, um, but uh, they, they just do seem to look like that in real life. Um, but essentially this first one here, you can see we've got the simple carpal and simple pistol uh, representation like before. Whereas on these other ones, you can see these faint lines are indicative of the fact that it might actually be multi carpals inside there if we were to split it open. And these ones are sort of partly fused up to the top. The bit that comes out at the top, which we're gonna cover in a minute, the stigma can sometimes, if there's multiple prongs can be indicative of the fact that we might have more than one carpal on the inside, but not always the case. Now it's very hard to get really good photos of these particular inner workings of the plants because Sometimes they're quite hidden inside or they're just so small that they're not going to come up on pictures. Um, looking deep inside this violet flower, um, you can only see the tip of the pistol here, which is obviously the stigma um, there. Looking at this rose, you can see in the center, we've got this bulging unit here, which is the pistil, which could be formed of multiple carpels or it could be a one simple. Um, we would need to sort of have a further look to know. But now at least, when you're reading through maybe some of the descriptions, when it talks about carpals, you'll know that that's what it's referring to. It's the inner bits that sort of make up the whole unit. So this plant is one of my particular favorites, meadow saffron. Um, and this one, you can see, you can only see part of the pistol coming out here, which is actually the style and the stigma here. Um, there are actually three stigma, although it sort of looks like a fairy's done a head first dive into there with its little feet poking out. Um, but like a lot of flowers, a lot of these inner workings are hidden away and you would have to definitely pull the plant apart to look at that information. And it's worth saying at this point, if you are trying to find this sort of level of detail on a plant, don't pick it if it's the only one there. Um, and, and generally with rules of picking plants, obviously we're all taught that picking wildflowers is wrong. Um, but if you're in the process of teaching yourself plant identification and you're with an expert with you who tells you that they're, you know, those are a very common species, whatever you're looking at, then it's absolutely fine to pick a little sample and have a look at it in more detail. But obviously we don't do that with orchids of any kind, even if, you know, you'd look in your book and common spotted orchid is a common plant. Um, and we just don't do it with anything that you can't see lots and lots of. Um, it's just obviously you don't want to be depleting what's there. But in the, for the purposes of learning, then it, it's fine, especially maybe in your own garden and you've got some, well, we like to all call them as gardeners weeds, um, but essentially they're a great place to start and have a pick apart of those species. So here's the example of the buttercups. As you can see in the middle, we've got this sort of green blobby thing, which is the multiple carpels that are free from each other. And each green blobby bit is a carpel and it has a little stigma attached to it as well. And buttercups um, are one of the sort of early evolutionary species. So um, they were sort of one of the first to evolve in, in their sort of how they're designed. And you would know that because if you opened up a wildflower guide, they would be one of the first groups that you come to. And as with pretty much all natural history identification guides, they're usually always put in evolutionary order, which I find really fascinating. 
So the first things in the book are usually the older, evolutionary speaking, and the ones towards the end of the book are slightly newer. Um, and we're still talking millions of years, but it's interesting to see that timeline. Again, just a slightly zoomed in picture of another one with multiple carpals, um, and you can see that they're all there separate from each other. So if we break down looking at the pistol um, into its inner workings, We've got the bulbous bit at the base, um, which is the really, really important bit, which is the ovary. And inside that um, are little ovules, and you see the word ovule here. Um, and the ovule is essentially the immature little seed inside the ovary before fertilization. Um, and the idea is, is this ovary sitting here waiting for pollen to land on the top here and get transported down into the ovary um, for fertilization. And then the flower has done its job and it can start working on creating those seeds um, to then disperse and create more flowers. So if we were to cut open an ovary, which is really difficult because they're all pretty much tiny, um, we might be able to see that then they've got the immature little ovules growing inside. Um, and you know, depending on how many carpels we've got, each carpel would have some ovules inside. So I cut this one in half, but as you can see, there wasn't a lot to see because it was so teeny tiny. However, I got a different one and cut that and had a look with my little microscopic attachment that I can put on my phone. And you can see these little immature ovules all bunched up there waiting to be fertilized. Uh, this was the flower that I cut open. And so you can see even with the naked eye, that little area of ovules down either side. And so that is the ovary. And it's just that bit at the bottom. Whereas the bit at the very top, the bit that most people might have again heard of this terminology, the stigma, is essentially the, the receptor at the very top, which um, is there to receive the pollen, basically, the male parts. Um, and then after that, the pollen would be delivered down to the ovary at the bottom. But the stigma is the bit that's at the top. Now I've made it look quite funky here, almost look like a cockerel's head, um, but it can look really, really varied, or it could look really simple. So if we look at some examples of stigma here, um, you can have them feathered, uh, a sort of bollob on the end, even a hammer. Um, these are sort of like the poppy family um, are often sort of multiple stigmas along the top. Uh, even a sort of little broccoli florette could, could happen. Um, and sometimes with these multiple prongs, they can have you know, sort of five or, or less or maybe more. And um, one of the things in the identification of that um, family or group of species can be um, labeled how many stigmas they normally have. So you can sometimes count these. For example, if we look in the center of this flower, you can see this sort of pink starfish octopus type structure in the center here. And that is the, there are five stigma basically there. Um, waiting to receive pollen. So that would say that in the description of this flower that it has five stigma. And they're often maybe a different color from the rest of it, or they could be um, slightly less obvious. On this one here, you can see that you've, um, they've got these little stigma that curl back on themselves, but essentially we've got three at the top there, um, and that is the stigma. So then, the stigma then are usually on a sort of, um, not always, but a little sort of stalk-like structure above the top of the ovary, and this is called the style. Now, it's not always present. Sometimes there isn't a style and the stigma simply comes out from the very top of the ovary, but quite often there is some form of structure that is the style. Now it's there as a sort of mechanical structure and support, but it also inside has the ability for the pollen to travel down to the center for fertilization. So it's there for many reasons. It's also there to elevate it at the center of the flower so that it's there more prominent for when pollen arrives on maybe the legs of a bee or something like that. So just, I mean, it's simply a stalk-like structure, but if we just reiterate, it's that bit that's supporting the stigma at the top of the ovary. So it's this simple bit here before you get to the stigma. Then if we go to the male parts of the flower, um, the stamen is how they're called um, as an individual unit here. 
Um, and I, I find a really useful way of remembering this, um, that the, the male parts is the fact it actually has the word men at the end, stay men. Um, so that can be useful, particularly as I think sometimes people can get maybe confused with stigma and stamen because they sound like that because they're starting so similar. So if you remember that stay men, because it's got men at the end, is the male part of the flower. Um, and it's basically made up of a stalk-like structure with a sort of um, often two parceled little blob at the end. Um, and the stalk-like structure is the filament and the bit at the top is the anthers. But we're going to cover those in a minute. But the whole unit together is the stamen. And these can be really important for identification in terms of how many stamen there are, um, uh, whether they're fertile, whether they've got an anther on the end, that sort of thing can be really useful. So if we look at some examples, so here looking at this rather beautiful bramble flower, um, I found a pink one, which was nice, worth taking a photo of. You can see it's absolutely jam packed full of uh, stamen here. So you've got these pink little stalk like structures with these sort of creamy off white blobs on the end and all of those are stamen uh, with pollen on the end. This gorgeous plant, Devil's Bit Scabious, you can see loads and loads of projecting stamen here, um, sort of lighter blue stalk and the purpley blue top to them. And then we've got something like this um, plantain. This is hoary plantain. Um, it's, at, it's like it's stamen delicious. It's absolutely covered in them. Um, almost can't see anything else for stamen here. And again, we've got the different colored filament, the lovely sort of lilac color, and then the sort of off-white um, anthers at the top. So it's that whole unit there is the stamen. So if we break that down then into its individual parts, we've got the anthers at the top, which are really, really important because they are the bits that contain the pollen um, that obviously is so essential to reproduction for the flower. Um, and these, again, as I said, some of them, maybe they're missing the stamen, so they're, they're non-fertile, um, anthers, sorry, missing them, so they're non-fertile, or sometimes they're always there. Um, I mean, essentially, I've got on the next slide here a picture of a dissected anther, but essentially, you don't need to know the inner workings of this. And there are different terminology and words to describe all the different parts of an anther itself. But I promise you, no book is going to go into that level of detail. Unless you're planning a PhD on a certain species, I wouldn't worry too much about it. As long as you know that that blobby bit at the end of that stalk, that's the anther and it's the top part of the stamen. That's all you need to know. And as we said, the stalk like bit has its own name as well. Um, it seems like everything in, in botany and in natural history has to have its own name. Um, and that's the filament here. And that is a simply the stalk that bears the anther. And you can see on this lovely viper's bugloss here um, that we've got those pink uh, filaments projecting out, um, quite contrasting against the blue of the flowers. But that is the filament, essentially. Right, so now I'm going to try and demonstrate this with some actual props. So if I stop sharing for one moment and then go to reshare, but with my other camera, then hopefully we shall be able to, brilliant, everyone can see. So ooh, in my face, here we have a prop flower that I have made. Um, and if we see it from the side, the idea is, is that we can go into the, all of the individual parts here just to reiterate what we've learned. So we've got the lovely stem coming up here, which bulges out um, to form the receptacle, which is this sort of literally in this case, a hard unit that is the basis for everything else to fix into. We've then got our outermost whorl or row of features, the sepals. Um, and if we were to talk about them as a collective term, it would be the calyx. We then have our rather beautiful showy petals here, the ones that are giving it the flamboyance to the flower, the attracting everything in. Um, and these, of course, you're looking at whether they're maybe they're notched or how many there are, whether they're overlapping, um, whether there are big gaps between them, that sort of thing, whether they're cut all the way down to the middle. And the collective term for these is the corolla, and particularly if they're obviously fused together. In the center of the flower, then, we have our female organ part, which is the pistil here. And if we just take this out for a minute, we can talk about that in more detail in a moment. But we've got 
obviously the male stamen that we've just covered here coming out and that is comprised of this lovely orange um, color of the filament and then the anthers with the pollen at the top. And then if we just look at the female part, we've got our pistil here with the bulbous ovary at the bottom and then we've got our um, style coming up here to the stigma at the top. And if we were to open it inside, we would have our immature uh, seeds, the ovules forming. And in some species, you could uh, open this up and find that we've got a separate wall dividing up maybe multiple carpels. Um, and that's there. So then we can just take this apart just to reiterate that. Um, and you can see that, again, we've got the stem coming up here to the receptacle. Now, in this one, I've made it so that we've got a superior ovary. It's feeling very superior to the rest because it's sitting on top of everything else. Whereas maybe on a different species, all of that might be housed in here or even um, formed underneath under here. And that's going to be an inferior ovary. Okay, hopefully that has helped by visualizing it a little bit. Um, and now I will reshare back to my presentation. There we go. Okay. Right. So one of the things I did mention is the fact that our beautiful, simple drawing isn't necessarily representative of all flowers and flowers can often look very, very different from each other. Uh, for example, you've got the pea family where all of the different bits of petal and sepal and things like that have fused and formed and there's keels and wings involved and another set of anatomy to sort of just familiarize yourself. Only maybe another three words you would need to learn, but it's just where they've adapted to create their particular shape of flower where a lot of the actual floral um, reproductive parts are tucked away inside out of sight. Equally, we can have plants that have much reduced their flowers to almost very little at all. Um, you know, there's nothing showy about this one from Sea Beet. Um, and it might be in this case that actually it's just relying on um, the, the wind to pollinate it rather than attracting in any insects. Um, however, it could be where a plant is very, very small that actually it's because the pollinating insect that it's targeting is also very, very small. And then you can have a whole other level up here where orchids are talk, uh, talked about. Remember, we were talking about uh, buttercups and how they're fairly early, evolutionary speaking. Well, then this is the other side of the scale with orchids, where they've, they're sort of a slightly um, further along. And they are incredible to look at. And essentially, they are all the floral parts that we've been discussing that have just been adapted and fused into different shapes um, to, to sort of replicate an insect um, and exposing various parts. But again, there's another set of terminology to describe the different bits of them, labellum and things like that. Um, so that could be something to come to later on when you've really got all of this other stuff grounded in your mind. Same again for euphorbia or spurge um, flowers. Again, there are a whole different kettle of fish. There's multiple different flowers, male and female, sort of within the same uh, cup area um, and this these are actually like bracts and things like that and then you have to learn about bracteoles and there's another set of terminology to learn. Even something as simple as what you think is a, a daisy like uh, flower you think well I've, you know I've got that because it's got all its petals around the outside and it's got the center in the middle whereas actually it's uh, it's not simply petals around the outside and a center in the middle each one of these little yellow blobs is a separate flower um, you can just see around the outside the ones that have opened out um, and basically the sort of bit that they're sitting in are much reduced um, sort of petals and it's got the inner workings for each one. Just the same as each white petal that is around the edge is an individual flower which has got an adapted long strap like part of it that is part of the flower. Uh, same goes for the thistle family. Um, uh, they have exactly the same. They have multiple flowers all on the flower head. If we just look at this very briefly, um, they would be called what's called a compound flower. So you've got these outer ray florets. So they would be like the white petals here. And then you've got the central disc florets. Um, so it's, they've just crammed all of their flowers into one small space and adapted how they look so that they still guide the insect to the center of the flower. <clears throat> 
Now we've gone over the flower in quite a lot of detail, but there are also other parts to the plant that are worth knowing the names for, uh, especially when it comes to identification. Um, we're not going to go into all of them, um, but we're going to cover the sort of main important ones here. So I would hope most people would be able to recognise what is a leaf on a plant. Um, sometimes it could be referred to as a blade, particularly if it's strap-like. And most people would know the stem of the plant as well that comes up from the ground that has everything else coming off it. If you're looking at grasses, then that stem would be given a different name, um, but come to the session on Friday and you can learn all about that and the different terminology for grasses. Essentially, where everything's sort of happening, where there's a bud or, or a, a leaf coming off on a stem, then that's a node. And the gaps in between are called internodes. You've then got the roots, obviously, underground. And I would think most people would be familiar with the roots. If we look a little bit closer at where a leaf comes out, um, we've got the stalk of the leaf coming out here, which is known as the petiole. Now, not all plants um, their leaves have a stalk at all. Some are actually fixed directly onto the stem and how they're fixed onto the stem is really important for identification as well. And maybe the length of the petiole can be quite important and how maybe the base of the leaf actually fixes onto that petiole can then be another diagnostic feature. This is obviously the node where everything's happening and coming off. And then there are some other little bits that are really important called stipules. Um, and these are like leaf-like structures that come out from the base of where the main leaf is coming out of the stem. Now, not every plant has stipules. And one of the things that it can say to sort of group it as a whole family of plants is whether it has stipules or not. Sometimes they are quite obvious leaf-like structures. Sometimes they're so reduced, it's hard to see them. And on things like the clovers, um, they've been adapted to sort of go up the stem slightly and have a pointed end and be striped and things like that. And they are so, an important feature in the clovers, the stipules. So it's worth familiarizing yourself with those. So if we look at this in a real example of this one, we've got the node here and the internode in between. So that's where the stem, where there's nothing happening. And then if we just go over the stipules again, so we've got this leaf coming off here from the main stem with the petiole, and we've got the two stipules that I've just made in red here coming off, but not to be confused with the bud that's in the axle of the leaf. So that's quite important to remember. Sometimes um, you can think that a plant has got stipules, but actually it doesn't because it's just the little bud that's coming out. Right, so hopefully um, if you've got a piece of paper, then we can uh, have a go at a quiz. So I'm just going to find my polls. Uh, which I can't seem to find for some reason. So we might have to do it the old fashioned way with a piece of paper, um, just because my polls don't seem to have been enabled. Um, I'm not sure if that's because of, I'm only a panelist possibly, I'm not sure. But um, it's no problem because it's simply writing down the numbers one to 10, which I'm pretty sure we could all manage. And if you don't even wanna write this down, just simply say it out loud to yourself um, and that's fine. So I've got the basic illustration of the flower again, and this time we're going to have a go at labeling it. So I'm gonna go through and just say exactly which bit it's pointing to. So if you want to write this down or say it out loud, do, and then we're gonna go over it afterwards. Ah, right, thank you. <laughs> the, uh, the poll has arrived, <laughs> thank you for that. Hopefully that's not in anyone's way um, and that should be being started. So you've got a multiple choice if you're doing it via the polls as well. Um, so you can choose which one. Essentially, number one, what is the feature that it's pointing to at the top here? Um, just that feature at the top, I should say. Number two, what's this middle section here, this sort of structure that's supportive? Number three, it's asking for what these big features are on the outside, the second uh, row or whirl of the floral organs, might give you a little clue there. Uh, number four is asking for this bit at the base here. And anyone know what that is? Um, might have talked about that at the beginning. Number five is asking about this rounded part of this unit here, just the bit at the bottom. Number six is talking about the first row of floral organs or the first whirl, um, these ones here. And you can, for these, you can use the individual term um, or the collective or both if you want to. Um, the same with 
the one up here as well. Number seven is asking you to identify this whole structure here. And again, you could give if either answer for this one. So it's this whole unit. Number eight is asking for this, uh, this particular structure here. So just that stalk-like structure. Number nine is asking for the whole of that unit as one, what that is. Ooh, just clicked, but it was all right. Um, number 10 is asking for the little bit at the end. Now, hopefully everyone has been able to have a go at the uh, polls. I can't actually see if anyone's had a go at it because I'm not in control of it, unfortunately. Um, however, it's just for a bit of fun. So now we're just going to go through the answers anyway. So if everyone's ready for that. Oh, I have to get rid of that. Right. So the first answer, hopefully everyone's put that, is the stigma at the top. So this is the top of the female part that is there to receive the pollen. We then, the stalk-like structure that's supporting that, which remember, not always there, um, is the style. Then this second row of uh, floral organs is the petal or the corolla. Uh, so you could put either there. If you put petal, totally right. If you put corolla, totally right. But both, even better, because then you're remembering both terms. Number four is the receptacle. So this one could be tricky to remember because we did it at the very beginning. Um, but essentially, if you think of some, it's like the cup-like structure that everything is joined into. This bottom round bit is the ovary. And remember, that's the bit that's got the little ovules inside um, for producing those seeds. We've then got the outermost row is the sepal, or you could use the group term calyx, or you could put both. Number seven, talking about this whole unit. Again, we've got two terms in this particular case that we could use, which is the pistil or the carpal. If in doubt, call it a pistil. <laughs> That's what I say. Uh, number eight, it's just this stalk-like structure, and that's the filament. And then the whole of this unit is, I've just got my own thing in the way, is the stamen. So that's the whole bit there. And then the final top part of the stamen is called the anther. And hopefully you can give yourselves all a big round of applause and you all did really well, I'm sure. Um, but we then have a second part to it. Um, which hopefully if Felicity has the capability to launch the second poll for people who want to take part, we then have the leafy bits, which we've only just covered and probably in not as much detail. Um, but this is the leafy parts of it. So what are we referring to at this point A? And as a result, what is this bit here B referring to? The sort of gap between the two. And over here on this illustration, which little leafy structures are we referring to for C? Um, for D, we're talking about the stalk here. So what one are we talking about there? I'll just give you a few moments to uh, maybe think of an answer for that. And I'll just cover the fact that obviously we call these leaves or leaf, or leaf blade. And then we've got the roots underneath and we've got the stem. So we haven't covered those with the questions. I'm going to, just because I'm aware of time, and hopefully we can go through it. So the first one we've said is node. And then as a result, the space between where nothing's happening is the internode. Then you've got the leaf-like structures. These are really important that, to know these, the stipules, and it's equally important to know when you haven't got them. So you need to sort of maybe go out there and have a look. And luckily in books, it often talks about that group of plants and whether they have stipules or not. So you could go out and look for some examples. And the little stalk for the leaf is the petiole. I was just going to quickly cover a few key questions that maybe might answer some of the questions that people have already asked anyway. But these are the ones I commonly get asked anyway. So what are the best books for plant ID? I get asked all the time. So a particular favourite of most is The Wildflower Key by Francis Rose. And it's an excellent book. Um, it really helpfully has all of the main defining features in bold um, and it has a really really good plant key. One of the only downsides about this is sometimes some of the illustrations maybe aren't as true to life as I probably would think they are, maybe the colours or that sort of thing. 
Um, or, and the other thing for me personally is it um, doesn't have grasses, sedges and rushes in it. Whereas this book, the Collins Wildflower Guide, second edition, has got all of the grasses, sedges, rushes and ferns and things like that as well. So I find that I can then take one book out with me and it has everything in it. Um, and the illustrations are fantastic. But equally, it's useful to have both. Which are the easiest groups to learn? Sometimes people ask me. Oh, no, sorry, I've just skipped a question. I was looking ahead. Are all flower keys the same? And the answer is no, strictly no, they are different. However, um, they all follow a similar style. Um, usually there's sort of two or three options that you've got to choose from before to move on to the next part. Um, and they often sort of follow the same structure in terms of what parts of the plant we're looking at. However, they are different in each one and you will get more familiar with one key than any other. So it's worth um, maybe sort of trying a few to see which one you like. What are the easier groups to learn? Uh, well, I would say the ones that you see more often, where you go for your walk, um, the flowers that you just happen to see all the time on the side of the road in the school run, or while you're you know, walking your dog, whatever you're doing, and you think, I see that plant every day, I'd really like to know what it is. That's the one you should start with first because you're gonna see it more often and then you're gonna recognize it elsewhere. So that's what I would recommend. What if you can't remember all this terminology that we've just gone through? Well, the simple answer there is in the back of most flower ID books, there is a lovely glossary, which for example, if you couldn't remember the net, you know, you're reading a description and it says the petiole is longer than of this other species. You go, oh, I can't remember what the petiole is. And then you look to the back and it says quite helpfully, a stalk of a leaf and it even gives you a little diagram here. So really useful. Um, I also have this brilliant book, um, The Plant Glossary by Q, um, which has pretty much every bit of terminology you can possibly think of to do with plants um, described in detail with a little illustration in as well. Another question I often get asked is, are plant ID apps any good? Well, we do actually in the National Plant Monitoring Scheme newsletter that we produced last summer have an entire review on that, um, if you would like to go and have a look at it, where we reviewed about 10 of the most commonly used apps. Um, one thing I would say with Plant ID apps is they can be a really useful additional resource or to get you started, because often they can tell you to the family that you want to go, but they are just working on picture recognition, recognition and algorithms. They are not taking into account where you are in the country or what kind of habitat you're in, or any of those little tiny features that we've discussed today, they can't, you can't often capture that with a photo. So I would say it can be often a good place to start if you have no clue in your book where to even look to use one of these. But I would say definitely have a book on hand as well. If you were to go and go down the Plant ID app as an extra resource, these are my two particular favorites. Um, Flora Incognita, um, they're both free, both of these. Um, is brilliant as well because it's a type of citizen science where everything you record um, then gets sent off and goes fed into direct into some data and it records your observations and I just find it's very easy to use. Equally a lot of people use Seek um, and I particularly like that one because it's got other groups and taxa in, it's not just plants, but as a result it's not always that good on plants so it, it's a bit of a mix that one. So what have we learned today? Um, and I'm sorry, I'm aware of time. I'm gonna try and speed it up a little bit. So we've gone through the receptacle, the base of the plant. We've talked about how the base of the plant, the receptacle can often maybe house some of the ovary parts, um, in which case the ovary is in the inferior position, or it can be just forming that basic cup-like structure for everything else to be fixed into and sit on top. We then discussed the sepals and as a group, they are called the calyx and how these can be really important identifying features. We talked about the petal or the petals and how as a group, they can be called the corolla, particularly if they're fused, like with the sepals and the calyx. We then talked about how the center part is the pistil um, that can be made up of one or more carpels, which is then comprised of an ovary style and stigma. And we talked about the differences between how the carpels are there, whether they're one simple and it's one pistil and one carpel, or whether there's one pistil that's then divided internally because it's fused into multiple carpels, or if they're all sitting freely together like that. 
We then talked about the male parts of the flower and how that's made up of the filament, the stalk-like structure and the anther on the top and the whole unit is referred to as the stamen. We then talked about the other parts of the main bit of the plant, um, the leaf or leaf blade, the stem, the internode and the node, the roots, the stipules, the petiole and the node. And hopefully now you'll be able to recognize all of these names and what they mean. What can you do to go and practice? Well, what I would say is you need to get out there and get out and about, go outside your front door, go for a walk, um, you know, go to your local park, wherever you want to go um, and, and start picking up. And there are flower things in flower at the moment. I know it's very early in the year, but there are things you can go and look at and practice with. What will you need to learn next? Well, there's going to be some new words, I'm afraid, folks, um, and they're going to get slightly more complicated. But in the future, these are going to be some of the words that we need to learn. Um, and I'm not going to go through them all now, but they are there. It would be really good if we could cover, say, five families of flowers. Um, and that, that's the next step. Get familiar with at least five families. And then think about how to use a key and how that's going to really help you move on with your plant identification. I'm sorry for rushing through the end, but I'm aware of the time. Um, but I am now ready to take some questions. If Felicity, you've made a note of any that are particularly good for us to start with. Hi, Sarah. That's been a really lovely session. Thank you very much. And I feel I've learned loads too. <laughs> good. We have um, we have a few questions. I'm aware of the time, so we'll yep. go through those. Um, one question from a couple of people. What microscopic attachment would you recommend for a foam? Ah, yes, um, they are really useful. And funnily enough, I actually bought it initially for my son and then realized I liked it so much, I nicked it and then had to buy him another one. Um, so uh, that particular one that I've been using, I think I picked up from one of the Wildlife Trust um, sort of shops uh, and RSPB shops sell them as well. But essentially you can find them online and they're about uh, eight or nine pounds, something like that. And it's just a little attachment that looks sort of like a um, a silver microscope attachment that you put on but any of them all do the same job and it just fits over your phone um, with the camera and it's really excellent for looking at closer in features. Thank you. We've got a question here from Judith um, and I think it's great that all these questions are coming in because there's quite a lot of information to take on. Judith <laughs> asks do all flowers have sepals and are sepals always visible? Um, so no, not all flowers have um, sepals, sepals, however you want to say it. Um, there, some, as we talked about, can be fused into this calyx-like structure, but other flowers, sometimes they've, um, and I didn't go into this just because of how confusing it can be, is that instead of having a separate sepal and a petal, they actually have a structure that is comprised of both of them almost as, as one unit, and it's referred to as a tepal. Um, and there are lots of... Um, plants that have got very reduced flowers that often just have a tepal and they're not necessarily relying on that pollinator to come in and be attracted to them so yes in in answer they don't always have strict sepals or calyx okay um we've got a question here can so you've recommended a wildflower guide for beginners um, somebody just wanted us to touch on the carpal again are the ovaries inside the carpal? Yes, they are. Yeah. So if you were to split open that one with the three fused carpals, each carpal will have a little ovary inside of it, all with the ovules inside, ready to bear seed. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, do plants, I think quite a lot of interest because you've taken us through the male and female parts of the plants. Yeah. If plants have both male and female parts, do they fertilize themselves? Uh, well, yes, is the answer. Um, some uh, very much are designed to do that and others are not. But yes, is the answer, um, because it seems like uh, it would automatically happen, but not in all species. But it is possible in a lot. A lot can self-fertilize, definitely. OK, and we've got I don't know if we're going to be able to answer this question that's come in from Jan, <laughs> um, who's talking about buttercups. How many types of buttercups are there? Um, what, in this country? I do know, Sarah, that buttercups are uh, the 
three common types of different buttercup are a good way to uh, practice some of our ID skills, aren't Definitely. they? Definitely, yeah, because of all the features are very obvious on them um and some of the distinguishing features between them are sort of dependent on some of the things that we've learned today um yeah so i would say a buttercup to a really good start and bulbous buttercup is the earliest flowering and should be out in probably next month or the end of this month um it should start flowering so you can get going with that Okay, Sarah, I think that's, um, that's all we've got time for today. I've just put the link for a session that takes this terminology and looks at plant families and you'll be running yep. that in March. We have yep. some other introductory ID sessions running throughout our Spring Interaction with Plant Life programme. Thank you everybody for joining us today and thank you, Sarah. I think no we all love the prop and I'm going to end the session now. Okay. Thanks so much, Felicity. And thank you everyone for listening.